Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Thanks, as always, for joining us here on The Avid Reader. Um, It's a pleasure to have you once again. Today, our guest is Joshua Hankin. We talked before the show about my name being Hankin, his name being Hankin, and our possible but unlikely uh, uh, heritage together in Belarus. Uh, author Josh is the author of Morningside Heights, which was published just this week by Penguin Random House. And he's also the author of the novels uh, Swimming Across the Hudson, a Los Angeles Times notable book, Matrimony, a New York Times notable book, and The World Without You, which was named an editor's choice book by the New York Times. He directs and teaches in the MFA program in fiction writing at Brooklyn College. So New York, Morningside Drive to the East, 125th Street to the North, I guess 110th Street to the South and then Riverside Drive. It's a really nice place on the Upper West Side, home of Ed Scott Fitzgerald, Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac among many. So anyway, be that as it may. Prue, Morningside Heights. Prue graduates from Yale and then falls in love with Spence at Columbia, who's her professor, a worldwide known Shakespearean scholarship with every award possible with whom she falls in love. And early on in the first 25, 30 pages, we understand that love and a wonderful relationship, which we watch as it progresses 30 years down the line. Then something happens something that seems to be happening more and more in our world. And the man, the husband, and the the love of her life, Spence, begins to become less of himself. And their relationship is tested by what he begins to become. Their children, Sarah and Arlo, orbit them and were privy to those relationships as they become crucial. And there's lots of other well-drawn characters that that, uh, mean a lot to the book. I wouldn't want to be in Prue's place, and I have no idea how I would handle the struggle she faces. I have faced it peripherally, and that's bad enough. It's a struggle that's lessened in the book by a new relationship that's both a boon and maybe a source of guilt for Prue. At bottom, the book makes us think not only about Prue and Spence, but about ourselves, our families, and the things that happen, you know, like either a phone call at 3 a.m or a long road on which we perforce or are made to walk. So welcome, Joshua, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Sam, for having me here. And uh, I was in, particularly impressed with your knowledge of Morningside Heights, you know, the, the southern and northern boundaries, the eastern and western boundaries. You could compete with some of those realtors up there. So that, that's great. I always wanted to live there. It's, it just seems so nice. And there's all the universities, and all the colleges there, just such a cool place. Yeah, you know, I lived there for the first 18 years of my life. Um, and then I left New York and I lived in a series of college towns and now I'm back in New York living in Brooklyn. But um, yeah, Boring Heights is a kind of strange place where you sort of feel like you're living in a college town even as you're living in the biggest city in America at the same time. Yeah. Oh yeah, that reminds me. And I don't think I'm giving anything away. And this is the kind of question I normally wouldn't ask because it's kind of a Terry Gross question, but... <laughs> In one of your uh, written interviews, you talk about this being your, kind of your most autobiographical book. A- a- and your father is like, is like considered one of the most influential contemporary scholars of international law and foreign policy. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how it influenced the book. Yeah, for sure. So um, you did a really great job of sort of describing the book really accurately and also not giving certain things away. And now it's going to be my turn to actually give certain things away, but it happens early in the book. So I'm not, there are no spoilers here. Um, Yeah, so my father taught at Columbia for 50 years and um, Spence, the the husband in the book, is a big Columbia professor and he develops uh, early Alzheimer's in his 50s. My father had Alzheimer's uh, very late in life in his uh, mid to late 80s. but, um, but he was still teaching at Columbia at the time. And so the book is really inspired by my, um, 
my father experience of the disease, but in some ways even more so by my mother's experience of disease, because the book is really not about Alzheimer's. It's about a marriage and about a family and about how you know, the various characters who surround Spence um, cope with it. But I guess I'd say that the specific inspiration for the book is that um, when my father was declining, um, at some point my mother briefly um, showed, took a class kind of support group um, at the, I think it was at the JCC on the Upper West Side of Manhattan for caregivers. Um, and I was really struck by that because my mom is not a consorting with strangers kind of person. You know, she tends to consort with the people who she feels she has things in common with. And so it's interesting to me that she was in a place in her life where um, she wanted to talk to people who had nothing in common with her potentially, except for the fact that they too were caring for someone in her position. And so the novel started as a kind of a long short story um, that took place at the JCC um, between Prue and a bunch of people she meets there. And then, you know, by the 40th draft, uh, the JCC was gone. And I realized that I was really writing about this extended family more than I was about uh, the friends that she meets um, as she's caring for Spence. You say a long short story, but then I read in the interview that, which I can't even imagine that you, you ended up with 3,000 pages. That's not a long yeah. short story. Well, so the, the long short story was 100 pages. If the, the novel in early draft was 3,000 pages. Yeah, that's just kind of how I write. Um, I think things have to be bad before they're good. And I think that in the first draft, you really want to proceed intuitively and allow the book to be a mess because, um, yeah, because what you think is, is important to the book, you're almost always wrong about. <laughs> I always tell, tell my grad students that, you know, they can think they know where their stories are going, but they better be wrong. And I think that that's true for me, too. Yeah, a lot of the author, the authors I interview always say, just write it. It's going to be really horrible, <laughs> but just keep writing it. It's going to suck. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I think for a lot, I think about this with my grad students and also with my friends who are writers, a lot of the challenges are, are psychological. You know, trying to get past the self-loathing, to get past, you know, the the self-censor, um, and to allow yourself to to write some really bad stuff in order to get to the book to where it needs to be. Yeah, and then there's those netwits that write with the idea of their title and seeing the inside flap twenty nine ninety five. You know, like. Oh, I want to. Add, I, I tend to go off on tangents, and I apologize. But I was thinking of your dad, and then Spence. Towards when it got a little worse, did they do what they did with Spence, like have TAs run the class while he was just kind of there? You're talking about my 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 father's own experience. Yeah, you know, it's, it's complicated because um, just the way the academy works in general in the arts and sciences, you do have TAs, um, but in the law school. There are no TAs. My dad did co-teach a couple of classes. And so I think that when he was declining, the burden of the teaching fell on his, you know, co-professor. But they lost the law schools don't have TAs the way that um, that arts and science classes do. Talk about how in the beginning, you know, and I've experienced this like with my Aunt Anne, who was what in her 90s before it started happening. But you know, you go over. I would go over every Sunday, kind of like uh, Spence does with uh, Enid. I go over every Sunday and I talk to her. And she goes, "How's your dad doing?" I said, "Well, he died." She goes, "Oh, that's too bad." And then, "How's Uncle Martin?" Which was her husband. And I said, "Well, he died too." And she goes, "Oh, that's a shame." And then the next Sunday, the same questions. And it sounds horrible, but it was almost not humorous, but almost kind of pleasant in a way. And then it became not. But in the beginning, it was like the way she said, oh, that's too bad. It was kind of, okay, you know, that's not so bad. Right. Well, and I think one of the interesting things about Spence um, is that, and the book I think notes this, is that even as, um, even as he declines tremendously, he kind of remains essentially himself. Um, and his personality really stays intact even as his mind is diminished. Not to jump ahead, but there's one moment in the book that I find totally pivotal. Do you know what that might be? Oh, I have no idea. Actually, I have no idea. 
for me, every moment in the book is pivotal because if you pivot wrong, you end up in a very bad place. I guess that's true because um, you're always in the middle of something. But no, it was when Spence, um, when he said to Jenny, when he saw the picture of the two, this is a spoiler. So when he saw the picture of the two of them. Oh, the other, the other husband reference. Yes. Yeah. That was yeah, it. That, that, because... that, that does feel like a bit of a spoiler. So I'm not, I'm not going to comment on that. But yes, that line, uh, that line was, is, was important to me into the book for sure. And without spoiling it, it's just the idea that, okay, and I've seen this too, all of a sudden everything is back to normal. And you understand there's this total comprehension, but it's just like mm -hmm. that, like in that um, that Nicholas Sparks book, The Notebook, and the movie with um, James Garner. And, you know. Yeah, I haven't read the book or seen the movie. I mean, I haven't seen the movie, so. Yeah, don't read a Nicholas Sparks book, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so, in your life, and especially in Prue's life, and especially when she talks about the Yiddish words she knows, which are the same Yiddish words I know, right. um, uh, how does Judaism take center stage from time to time? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a fairly traditional Jewish home, and my parents were kind of the op the reverse of what uh, Prue and Spence are. And my father was the one who was raised Orthodox. He actually remained Orthodox until the day he died. Um, and my mother grew up in a, not in a secular home exactly, but in a reformed Jewish home, a sort of more culturally Jewish than uh, observant home. Um, whereas in, uh, in Morningside Heights, uh, it's Spence who's secular and um, Prue who's, who's raised traditional and then you know, after she marries Spence, um, she kind of falls away from tradition. And yeah, I do think Judaism is important to the novel. It's kind of important in its absence in a certain way. I think one thing that, um, you know, as, as Spence is declining, Prue goes back to synagogue. Um, she, you know, one time she says Kaddish for her father. Another time um, she goes on the Sabbath to say the blessing for the sick when, uh, when Spence is, is in bad shape. And I think, I think she, you know, I think she misses, I think she misses her Judaism of her childhood, but feels that she can't get it back. And I, I feel like I know a lot of people like that who kind of yearn for something that they also don't yearn for and they don't really want it, but they also feel like there's something sort of missing. And so I think that, I think Judaism in the book, it kind of hovers over the characters as a, a present absence. Yeah, I agree. And it kind of correlates with my life as well. Because the way I always thought about it, and I don't know whether you feel this way too, is so much of it makes perfect sense. And then so much of it doesn't make any sense at all to me. You know? You're talking about, about Judaism or Jewish ritual or? Essentially ritual, like the blow torches and, and, and things like that coming in to make sure that the house is kosher and- Right. But at the same time, the, the philosophy and the metaphysical aspect of it seem, as far as other religions, much more logical to me. Right. I think, you know, the ritual for Prue, and this is probably true for me as well, but, you know, the ritual for Prue um, is important because of its historical importance in her family. Um, you know, she's not a believer, but... Um, but this is part of this is her community. Um, I mean, I know a lot of Orthodox Jewish atheists, so and that feels like it should be a contradiction, but I don't see it as one. And I guess I would think of. I mean, Peru is no longer Orthodox, but um, but I think that um, that her attachments to tradition are not about belief, but are about practice that is divorced from theology in a certain way. I just realized, since I do own an independent bookstore, I always forget that we're trying to sell your book. <laughs> so do you have it there so you can show the cover? Because I always like to show covers. Yeah, and I, I gotta say, I, I really, and I obviously take no credit for this because I'm not the designer, but I really love this cover. I think it, um, you know, 
I it just it pops visually, but I also think that it, um, you know, I mean, you want to look at a, at a cover kind of the way you look at a title, that you want it to be evocative before you've read the book, before you've opened the book, but you also want it to feel right after you've read the book. And I feel like this cover uh, does both those things. And just the, the way it evokes um, Spence's presence and absence uh, in the book, visually. Yeah, it's kind of like Magritte, but um, yes. the, or the Invisible Man. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and you know, I've said this maybe 700 times now, but as many times as people say you can't judge a book by its cover, every single person, without exception, unless they know what they want, comes in there looking at the covers. And the thing that's cool about this is that it's sitting on our front desk and you can't look at it without thinking, I wonder what that's about. Right. And, you know, it's kind of like the outside of a jigsaw puzzle box or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, definitely it's something that you would say. Yeah, and me specifically, I would do it because of the last name. But <laughs> but in any event, yeah, it's a really good cover. And like I said, you said, you don't take credit for it, but I think publishers are really smart because they design covers because they want to sell books. And right. it really makes a difference, like I said, on the front table or in the window. For sure. I think, it, I think it's the most important thing. It's funny, isn't it? Um, well, we know that Prue is kind of like our Virgil in this thing, but the interesting thing, and you've said it in the interviews too, is the most complex character is Arlo. Why don't you talk a little bit about him? Because if you don't talk about him, it's like people won't know that there's this important person that's so well drawn and so, so strange. Yeah, so just, you know, to give people some context, um, Spence was had a brief marriage before he met Prue and he had a son from that marriage and, and he and the son's mother split up when, the, when Arlo, the son, was eight months old. And um, for the most part, Arlo is raised by his mother, who's a certain kind of hippie who moves about the country and, you know, he's, you know she says she wants to poop in all 50 states. And so Arlo is sort of, um, you know, towed along by her. Um, and for a couple of years, he lives with Prue and Spence and with Sarah, their, their daughter. Um, but it's a complicated two years and it's a complicated relationship. Um, Arlo is dyslexic and uh, Spence is a Shakespeare professor. Um, and Spence tries to um, prepare Arlo for the SAT by quizzing him on vocabulary words. And that in a nutshell kind of describes the tension in their, in their relationship. And yeah, you know, and it, Arlo didn't come out, come into the book until probably three or four drafts in. I just, at some point, it sort of gets back to what you were saying before about the 300 pages, sorry, the 3,000 3, pages. Um, you know, you really have to see where a book goes and let yourself be surprised. Um, and I just at some point said, you know, to myself, um, well, what if Spence was married before and what if he had a son? And I thought, nah, that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Um, but then I tried it. And as soon as I started to write Arlo, the book really took off and opened up. So yeah, to me, he is, you know, he, he's not really the protagonist of the book, but in some ways he's the most important character in the book. He's the character who's most different from the others. He's a live wire. And um, yeah, he's, 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 he's near to my heart. Part of it kind of you pissed me off because when Spence is giving him the list of words, I'm thinking to myself, I knew all these. <laughs> I knew all these at one time. Like I could do Piquant or Solipsism or Nomen or something like that. But then there were these other ones I'm thinking, yeah, I know what that means. Well, taking, you back to, taking you back to high school. Did you know what all of them meant or did you have to? I did know, uh, I do know what all of them meant. I mean, um, I mean, I am not dyslexic, but um, <laughs> I sometimes think Arlo is kind of like the fantasy of what I kind of sort of, but not really would have wanted to be like. But um, so yeah, my father did come home from the law school every day when I was, you know, a sophomore and junior, senior in high school, with a list of words he, he'd he purportedly run across during the course of his day. But some of these words 
I have never run across since and had never run across before. So I don't know where he was running, except he was running across some of these words. But yeah, I do know that I do know all those words. It's funny how you pick something, you know, it's like Spence picks that and makes sure and wants to make sure that people comport to the behavior that he expects of them. And then you have like Arlo, who from early on is just money. I mean, he seems to feel like there's no moral judgment with regard to his desire. But it's like, it's like if someone goes out and buys a Lamborghini. I never understood it because I couldn't quite understand. <laughs> and this is stereotypical, but maybe being Jewish is like, I don't want to park. You know, I'm afraid if I park it somewhere, someone's going to open the door or I have to go to the last parking space in the lot and park it diagonally. And it's just too much trouble for me. But I always wondered, okay, what is exactly they're saying when they do that? And Arlo kind of wanted to get to that point, not necessarily, well, yeah, with material things too. Yep. I mean, I think it's true. I think for in a lot of ways, Arlo, I mean, Arlo probably wants money because he was raised in kind of relatively destitute circumstances. I mean, his mother didn't have much money, but I think also he values money precisely because his father doesn't value money and looks down on money. And so it's kind of, a big screw you on some level to his father. I might, you know, I can no longer remember what's in the book and what got cut, but I think it might still be in the book. And this is, but I believe Spence, there's a reference to Spence once saying to the Dean of the business school. So you mean you can go to school for that? And whether that's in the book or not, it is something that my father said, I believe to the Dean of the business school, certainly to a business school professor. So, you know, Spence is pretty deeply ascetic and pretty deeply anti-materialist. And I think, uh, you know, I think the tensions between Spence and Arlo play out in various ways. But, you know, Arlo is going to be rich and um, he's going to make it in tech. And that's how he thinks he's going to show his father. How do you feel about that? I mean, I know exactly how I feel about Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos. Do you have like a global opinion of these people who put a dent in the universe, but at the same time might be assholes? Well, I certainly have opinions about, I mean, I, I don't have opinions about it as a novelist, by which I mean, right. you know, I really feel like fiction is a mirror, not a judge. And, you know, I think it was John Gardner who said that, um, you know, you better not have a character make an argument for something and if you do they better be wrong or you better disagree with them i mean i think he's obviously exaggerating but i think what he's saying is that you know your character should not be mouthpieces for the writer and um i think a writer has to treat all their characters equally and you know i see this with some of my grad students you just feel the writer is siding with a particular character and it's, I always think it's to the story's detriment. So I really have no opinions about this as a novelist. I mean, if I, if you ask me have opinions about it as a human, of course, because you know, I have opinions. Um, I, you know, I mean, there are rich assholes and there are poor assholes. I certainly think that, um, that um, there are big problems in corporate America. And I think that the, um, the amount of inequality, economic and otherwise, that is, present in this country and that is expanding in this country is really worrisome. And so some of these companies are, seem to me, many of these companies are deeply, deeply problematic. But that's what I feel as a human being. That's not what I feel as a novelist. I really park my opinions about really about everything at the door. Yeah, and the reason I ask that is because like when the reader, or this is for, is reading about Arlo, it's like, you're a little wobbly, you know? It's like, do I like him? Do I dislike him? I mean, what he did to Sarah when she's in bed? I mean, how could you do that? And how could you just come and talk and then turn around? And, and then I thought, well, yeah, I can kind of understand that. And then at the end, the deed he does. Um, but yeah, I, I see exactly what you're saying about you're not taking a position. I mean, it's hard, but it's hard not to, right? 
I mean, it's got to be hard not to. Well, I, I mean, I understand why you say that. I don't find it hard. I mean, I find so much hard about writing, but that I don't find hard. In other words, I think when you spend <clears throat> enough time, and you know, I spend years with these characters, and you see them in all their complexity. Yeah, I just don't. I, I think you know, you don't get reduced to judgment. And you also don't get reduced to a kind of like or dislike. And I actually think that that's important for readers, too. I mean, I'm obviously a reader in addition to being a writer, and I'm not interested in make as a writer in making characters likable. Or, or not likable. In other words, I'm not invested in that question. As a writer, I'm not invested in it as a reader. I just want the characters to feel real and complicated and interesting. And so my goal with, with Arlo, though that's no different from my goal with any other character, is to make him interesting, to make him, you know, visible, recognizable, you know, to plumb the depths of him. Um, and if I am able to do that with him or with any character, then I've succeeded with that character. And if I'm not, then I've, I've failed with that character. But yeah, in terms of like, I, mean, I think one of the pleasures of writing and actually one of the pleasures of reading is being able to spend time, enjoying spending time in the company of a character whom you might not want to spend time in their company with, I'm getting lost in prepositions, um, in real life. I mean, you know, in real life, the character is there, you know, in your face. Whereas in a book, even if they're in your face, you can close the book. Um, and so you do have a certain measure of control as a reader. And so I think that allows you to have, you know, interesting and complicated experiences with other humans. You know, even from in your actual life. Even though it just came out, I know it'll, you know, we have like a bunch of book clubs and yeah, it would be great if you Skyped in or whatever, but yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to. Oh, cool. Um, you know, what's going to happen in the book club, which sometimes I call Fight Club, is mm -hmm. is that they're all. I know what they're going to do. How what how could Arlo do that? How could he do that to his father? And someone else is going to say, "Well, do you understand how he was brought up?" And you under so there is going to be, which I expect that you wanted this conflict with your reading audience. And the other thing about that is it makes the book very cinematic, which means you'll probably be optioned for a series with Netflix or whatever. Because um, it is it is quite cinematic. You can almost create the scenes, especially with the peripheral characters. Like, well, we should talk about the other um, sibling, daughter, Sarah, because if you're talking about, okay, you don't take a stance. Sarah seems like a, just a good person to me. Mm -hmm. She seems like a good person who does her best. And especially in that incident we discussed that I didn't spoil, she does something that I wouldn't have done. I would have run to my parents right away. Right. So you're talking about how, the, I mean, I, I understand why you're not being specific. So you're talking about the way that how she reacts to Arlo's kind of having tortured her. But I guess what I'd say is that she tortures Arlo too. She makes fun of him. Oh yeah, she does. I mean, I feel like she she's complicated also. Um, is she a good person? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like all of us, we're sometimes good people and sometimes less good people. And the ways in which we're good and less good differ you know, based on who we are and the circumstances we're in. So I, I understand why it's tempting to think of her as like the good child and Arlo as the bad child, but I don't look at them that way. It's funny. Uh, I only say this because everyone says this about me, but when you went, is she a good person? Eh, it sounded like Larry David. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, so what about the, you know, the heroine of the book, this woman that takes care of Spence and is strong enough to lift him and um, has a son who has his own issues. Where did they come from? Because they're so well drawn too, like I was saying about the yeah, panel. So yeah, so Ginny is the uh, is the caregiver. Um, and yeah, to me, that relationship is so interesting and complicated. 
I mean, as, as I said before, you know, my father had dementia late in life and, um, you know, for a number of years he had a 24 hour home care. And although my mother was there taking care of him too, um, it was really a full-time job, a paid job for two women um, who worked, you know, were employed by my mother. And I think that kind of caregiving relationship is very, I mean, it is a very complicated relationship. There are always issues of class. There are often issues of race um, because it's often the case that, um, that the person being cared for as in Spence's case is white and the person caring for him is a person of color. Um, and in a weird way, this person becomes like family, except they're not family. They have their own family and it's a professional relationship and but it also becomes a personal relationship and i think that for um you know and i think i might have cut this from the book because it just didn't fit in in the scene but you know there's, there was a scene i wrote in which you know um you know spence calls out and prue comes in to tend to him and spence says no i want Ginny. Ginny is the caregiver and there's a way in which you know at toward the end you know, Ginny knows Spence better than Prue does. The caregiver knows the patient better than the spouse does. And I think for Prue, that is both a relief and a loss. I mean, why it's a loss is obvious because, you know, she's Spence's wife and Ginny's an employee, but it's also a relief because I think it's a very, very, it is a very hard position to be the spouse, the loved one of someone who's struggling with what Spence is struggling with. So uh, the complexity of the relationship on both a personal and cultural slash political level really, really interests me. And um, yeah, so I, you know, Ginny is different from the people who were caregivers for my father, but I think she's inspired in some way by the caregivers for my father and the relationships that my mother had with them and my father had with them and the relationships that my brothers and I had with them because, you know, although we weren't living with our parents, we saw them regularly and we got to know the caregivers. And so, you know, we were, we were part of that, um, that dynamic too. Yeah, it's funny ever since you said a few minutes ago, I've been thinking about it where you say every moment's pivotal. I guess that's true pretty much in life anyway. But the two pivotal moments I saw in the relationship between Ginny um, and Prue was, and it's kind of elliptical, almost in a geometric sense, is when, is when Ginny says to Prue, I thought you said you were with Camille last night. And the other side of the coin is when Prue says to Ginny, I'll pay you for not working. And Ginny responds like an upstanding, righteous, good person would. Those are two different things. That yeah, yeah, Ginny has a lot of pride as, as she should. Yeah, so I think um, both those things that you're mentioning touch on like some pretty interesting facets of that of the relationship between the employer and the caregiver. So yeah, the, you know, in the first case, you feel like Ginny is protecting Spence from Prue. That Ginny, you know, that Ginny's loyalties are to Spence and if Prue is doing something that Ginny is suspicious of, you know, Ginny has Spence's back. And I like the way she doesn't say anything. She just gives her a look. Yeah, that's that's Ginny. She says, she says a lot with a few words. Yeah. Um, and with a few gestures. Um, yeah, and the paying for not working um, because they want Ginny to stay down in DC while they're there to um, have Spence take this experimental drug that Arlo has found. Um, yeah, I think that that is, I think that's an example of the power imbalance in the relationship, the money um, that Prue and Spence have and that Ginny does not have. And um, 
you know, Prue is not a very entitled person in general. No. I mean, she doesn't know she, but I guess I mean, she doesn't act entitled. But I think in moments of crisis, certain things slip out. And probably to her own horror, she acts more entitled than she would like to. Yeah, their monetary situation is uh, unusual too, because at first when he's winning the MacArthur and other awards, which come with substantial amounts of money. And when he's got his advance on his book, you know, you think, oh yeah, they're really going to make it in a, in a big way. And then actually they don't. And other than Arlo's intervention, they, yeah. And that was cool too, the way Arlo did his real estate deal. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he says, look, well, if you sell it, I'm just going to have to buy it. <laughs> I'm just going to have to buy it myself. Right. That was pretty good. Um, yeah, so I'm just rambling, but going on to say Walter, for example, um, and and it it's not giving anything away because all these reviews say the stuff that I don't think reviews should say, but they talk about Walter being this romantic interest that she discovers during this kind of semi-tragic time. Do you think that's, and she, do you think, as I said in the introduction, that she feels both like relieved and lifted and guilty at the same time. It's hard to tell, really. I think she does. No, and I also think that you know, I might think she feels guilty, but I think one thing that's interesting is that um, she remains totally loyal to Spence. In some in some weird way, like being with Walter makes her more loyal to Spence. Um, I mean, I think she fears that it's a betrayal, but I think when she goes through that, I, I think she. And the book don't exactly experience it that way. It's funny how you start Prue off because you make her somewhat forward sexually. And you also do this thing where she likes older men from the very beginning. Right. That was really interesting how you set it up that way. Yeah, you know, Garcia Marquez said that, um, and he was only sort of joking when he said this, that um, he finds collections of stories 12 times as hard as novels, because once he has the first paragraph, everything else follows. Um, and so you need 12 first paragraphs for a collection of stories and only one first paragraph for a novel. But I, I do think that, you know, the, the book opens up with um, the fact that Prue is attracted to older men. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, Spence is really not that much older than she is. He's only, yeah. he's, only, he's only six years older than she is. But I think, I think what the book is getting at is the way in which Prue, Prue's sense of identity, maybe in general, is attached to her romantic partner's accomplishments. And that's been true even when she was young. You know, she went out with the captain of the JV bas basketball team when she was three or four years younger. So I think. I think that's very fundamental to Prue, and it's certainly fundamental to Prue in her relationship with Spence. Because that's what that's what really interested me most in terms of that marriage, is that she is someone who's you know very intelligent and accomplished in her own right, but you know gave up her career for her husband, um, and you know went down a path that she probably wouldn't have anticipated, um, and Spence's success is her success. You know, she's happier about his MacArthur than she than he is. He's kind of embarrassed by it. She throws him this party for the MacArthur. He wishes she hadn't. Um, and I think it's like, you know, his MacArthur is her MacArthur too. In some ways, it's more her MacArthur than his MacArthur, is emotionally. And so that when he really starts to decline, I think the impact on her is devastating because there's a weird way in which her identity has been at least as tied up with his success and maybe more tied up with his success than his own identity is. And so she really has to reinvent herself in the wake of his illness. Yeah, it's like at the beginning, well not, yeah, at the beginning when she does marry Spence and her coterie of friends who are still moving on with their lives trajectory, you know, she has her MRS degree and um, at first she feels bad. She feels like they're making fun of her, but they're a nice bunch of people, especially Camille. Mm -hmm. 
And um, she has, you know, she has a, a good group of friends whose friendship is really important to her. Um, and I think also though, and maybe this is especially true, you know, I mean, if you get dementia late in life, usually your partner will have other people who are in the same boat as you. But if you have a partner, if you have a husband in this case, who gets dementia in his 50s, and Prue is actually several years younger, she's in her early 50s, then I think it's very, I mean, I think it's isolating under any circumstance, but I think it's especially isolating when no one in your peer group is going through that same thing. And so I think she does take solace in her friends, but I also think that she feels like she can't quite turn to them in some way. Hey, when Walter takes her to the game and she says the Knicks suck, I thought, I wonder if he likes basketball. If he likes basketball? You. Or if I like basketball. I do. I'm not a Knicks fan for some strange reason because I grew up in New York City. I'm more of a college basketball fan than a pro basketball fan. But, I, you know, when the playoffs come around, I'm enjoying watching the Nets in the playoffs. Um, you know, now they're my local home team because I live, you know, a mile from Barclays Center, which is where the Nets play. Um, I was... Um, I was captain of my high school basketball team. Really? It says a lot less about me than it does about my high school, certainly about my high school basketball team. <laughs> you know, I, was just a, I went to a small Jewish school where, you know, a half decent five foot 11 guy was able to play basketball. Um, but yeah, basketball is a big part of my childhood. It's, less, it's a less big part of my life now, but I, I, still, I still enjoy a good basketball game. And I, I got my MFA at the University of Michigan. Um, and I came to Michigan in 1991 to Ann Arbor, the same time that the Fab Five of college basketball fame came to Ann Arbor. So um, my time when I was getting my MFA was actually pretty basketball heavy, at least in terms of my spectating life. You talk about fathers and sons in relationship. I remember taking my son to game six of what should have been Michael Jordan's last game in Salt Lake City because I was able to get tickets on Sunday because they were all Mormons. Uh -huh. But, um, and I watched when he did that shot where he just did that. And, and I saw him steal the ball from Carl Malone. And it was like, it was right in front of me. And I'm saying, this is literally impossible what he just did. Mm -hmm. Steal the ball from the front of him and get it from the back of him. And it, it felt like if he was the only person on the court for the Bulls, it wouldn't have made any difference at all. Mm -hmm. he, was, he, was, he was a pretty good player. Not that this has, once again, anything to do with selling your book. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, and the other question that's totally irrelevant is, if you look over your left shoulder, what's that set of books that looks like encyclopedias? So my wife is a professor of religion. She teaches uh, ancient Jewish texts including the Talmud. And so what you are looking at are not encyclopedias for the most part, but are um, various traditional Jewish texts, including the six tractates of the Talmud. Um, so my, you know, we have a big study here and I, and I have my books and she has hers and we work catty corner from each other. Yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with the way your books look. Like my bookstore, I kind of keep it neat but I really like bookstores more that look like what yours looks like, where you run out of space and you stack, keep stacking them up. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not good at keeping things neat in general. So the, the, this, the books are actually pretty neat compared to what they, what they could be, but yeah, you know, they are kind of overflowing. Well, as I get farther and farther away from the book, I guess we get closer and closer to the end because it really doesn't help you much. But what will help is that, um, as I said, um, and I know it just came out, but it, it is on the front table, I guess, today. Because oh, when you sent out that nice letter, did you send that out to everybody or was that just to us or how'd you do that? So remind me which nice letter you're talking about. <laughs> you sent a nice letter where you thanked all the independent bookstores for hanging with you over this past year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, might, I do want to say that, you know, I mean, um, Morning to Heights was supposed to come out in June of 2020 and it was pushed off because of COVID. Um, and I, um, 
there were a lot of great things about that delay. I mean, obviously it's, it was hard to, would have been harder, harder to publish the book in June, 2020 than it was in June, 2021. But I feel most important, this gave me a chance to be in touch with, you know, really hundreds of independent booksellers. And, you know, I was very lucky and very fortunate to have the book be chosen the number one in your next pick for June. Um, and that's really thanks to independent booksellers around the country. And so, you know, and Arlo work, works in an independent bookstore uh, as a teenager. So there's an independent bookstore in the novel itself. But I feel that independent booksellers are the true unsung heroes of publishing. And so to get a chance to speak to people like you and really to, to independent booksellers all around the country um, has really been the greatest benefit of the, the year long delay. And so, yeah, I'm so happy to have the book, you know, on your table and on the tables of independent bookstores all around the country. I wasn't going to just say goodbye now because it's the perfect time to say it, but now you reminded me of, because uh, there is humor in the book. And I really like the way that uh, Arlo misfiled the books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tell, tell about how, just tell a few of them. Yeah, as well, you know, you know the book better than I do because it's been a while since I've, uh, since I've read it, but Arlo, you know, he puts Faulkner as I lay dying in death and mourning, or he puts Brideshead revisited um, with the wedding magazines. And you know, I mean, he is dyslexic and, but there, you know, there's a fine line between what he does knowingly and what he does not knowingly and what he does out of ignorance and what he does, um, because of a wish to sabotage. And so, yeah, yeah, there's a scene in the book where he's, you know, misfiling all the books um, and he gets into a certain measure of trouble. Eventually he's fired, um, but he's kind of looking to get fired. And that's kind of what he's like in general, uh, figuratively, metaphorically. He's trying to get himself fired. Yeah, I know exactly what that's like. But I, yeah. I, it, sorry. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that what you said about the humor. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that is actually really important to me is that, you know, I, the book's not a depressing book. I mean, there there's some sad things that happen in the book, but it covers a long relationship and um, there's a lot of humor. And I don't know, I just think there's, um, I, I don't see it as a book about Alzheimer's. I see it as a book about a family um, and a marriage where someone does get a horrible disease, but that's only a small part of really what the book is about, at least as I see it. Yeah, a lot of it is actually uplifting and like the humorous part, like when she still has uh, his brother's sneakers and says, yeah, I gotta give them back to you. And she, he goes, when? She goes, well, I can come over right now. <laughs> she is forward, I think. Yeah, but, in, her own way, in her own way she is. Okay. <laughs> Now, now this is an awkward way to end it, but <laughs> we'll end it. So it was a pleasure talking to you. The book is Morningside Heights and it just came out today. And, um, but we're, we opened the box that says do not open and we can open it today. Well, sometimes I cheat a little bit, but I didn't this time, honestly. And uh, so it was a pleasure talking to you and- Really nice to talk to you, Sam. And I'm really happy to be introduced to you to your store. As I said before, I'm happy to get on Zoom and talk with the book groups at the store. Be my That'll be great. We'll keep you, we'll hold you to it. Okay. I'm okay. happy to get out to it. All right. Take care. Have a nice day. Thanks for having me.